All right, Oval fans. Now, I will probably agree with everybody who says this that this was the best episode of Season 3 so far. But just remember, this was only Episode 3. Season 3, Episode 3 entitled The Mole. And everybody and their mother, whether it be in the Oval Facebook group, which you should definitely join. There is a link in the description box below along with all the other social media I have. Um, Everybody just talked about Priscilla telling off Veronica. I mean, Victoria. And, you know, making her presence known. I, you can't get rid of me. And the connection between her and Victoria's father, Curtis. But, really, if you take away the Priscilla scenes, did the episode really stick with you? Because I watched it this morning along with House of Pain and Assisted Living. Don't get me wrong, I, I like... I love our, our kind of people, but I'm glad I didn't have to, you know, have as many shows to watch and review today. But when you don't talk about the Priscilla scenes, this episode was kind of dry. It wasn't awful, but I think it made me, I think I was able to tolerate a lot of the characters. And it's kind of sad that Barry needs to be high off a joint to be likable. <laughs> And uh, his scene with Nancy, I prefer that compared to what was it last week when uh, he went off on his mom and she's like, I will put you out of your dis disrespect one more, one more time. Um, So, even though I think the score is a bit too high, I will give this episode a 5 out of 10 for being I. Right, you know? Like, to be honest, I'm not even... You know me. Like, as soon as something pops off, I'm like, yo, I gotta figure out everything... I'm not really that invested in the Priscilla and connection to Victoria's father. I'm sorry if I don't capture the excitement that everybody else has about this, but I've just been such a non-fan. I just have not liked what uh, Tyler has done with Priscilla's character at all since season two. I just do not like her. I've said it 50 times already. Taja's performance top notch the demeanor of the character Priscilla I do not like just because I feel like I'm kind of numb you know how whenever there's like a uh oh is so and so pregnant who's the baby daddy like on sisters just wondering hmm is Karen going to get pregnant is the father Aaron or is it Zach or with the haves and the have nots you at the last minute oh Candace is pregnant by Charles and what's he going to do about it then of course the longest running baby mama or baby daddy storyline that never got resolved who's the father of Alex's baby I'm just numb to the baby drama I mean hell we even almost had it here with Sharon until the baby got killed off in the car wreck um the crazy woman you know first it was this basically the bitter scorned black woman Veronica uh, then of course you have Karen now, not as crazy, but then again, you know, it, it definitely feels like Tyler Perry is going that acrimony route at some point with Karen. Then of course, you know, Melinda from acrimony and the list goes on. So with Priscilla acting the way she is, I'm just, I'm sorry. I, I'm just not invested. So all that's to say before going further in the video, please take a moment to hit the like button, hit subscribe and hit the bell icon and select all. I check the analytics every day. You all have been helping out the channel in more ways than one. Um, the subscriber count is increasing. We're getting closer to 190,000 people here. Uh, the ad revenue has been steadily going up. It's kind of ironic because it's not going up as fast as or as high as gas prices, but it is increasing because the views are coming in. You all are helping out the channel. I I'm noticing more engagement from the number of likes and the number of comments. So it, it seems like we're kind of getting back on track, not just because, um, you know, the name change and whatnot, but since the shows are back on the air, it looks like we're kind of making it back to where we were before, which I appreciate. So like, subscribe, and notifications. And like I mentioned before, the Oval Facebook group, along with all the other social media pages, are in the uh, description box below. So, like I said before, this episode was just Priscilla flexing. And I mentioned this in my... Didn't I do a video yesterday, right? Or was it... 
a couple days ago about Priscilla being the mole. And um, I said something along the lines of, it doesn't make sense. You know, there are so many things that she wasn't there for. How would she have known to tell Curtis about it? And in this episode, Priscilla never confirmed that she was the mole. She just has connections. She knows people. So I feel like that really does give us more questions and answers. It doesn't tell us who the mole is. It just makes us wonder if Priscilla isn't the mole, how does she have this connection to Curtis's or Victoria's parent? Well, parents, let's be real. No, no, uh, no doubt that she had connections to Victoria's mother as well. Or, you know, other important people like maybe members of the five families. There are theories floating around where people are like, Jeremy, do you think Priscilla is Curtis's daughter, Victoria's sister? I don't know. I will say this much. I don't know if this warrants a separate video, but I probably will do one about how is Priscilla connected to Curtis or is Priscilla Victoria's sister? In season one, Victoria told Max her backstory. Victoria is the darkest person in her family. Which, after seeing Curtis's complexion, makes me question a lot. But, I mean, it, it, it's like Curtis is a Hershey bar. Or, no, no, no. Curtis is a... Okay, Curtis and Maude are a Reese's Cup. Curtis shares the complexion of the outer chocolate, you know, shell, if you will. While Maude has the lighter complexion as the peanut butter filling. So... Out of all the siblings that um, Victoria has, if I remember correctly, Victoria is a bastard child. Or, oh, she was born from an affair. God, I cannot remember. Was it her mother or father? No, I think it was her mother that stepped out. I, it would look. If you remember, let me know. I remember it was like, what was it? Season one, episode seven, The Black Sheep, where the first like seven minutes of the episode was Victoria giving us backstory exposition. But regardless, one of her parents stepped out of the marriage and had her. And then she was brought back into the family. But she was always treated as the outcast for being darker than her other siblings and whatnot. Now, Tyler Perry could either retcon this one or two ways. He could either just say, yeah, Priscilla is a sibling that Victoria didn't know about, but the only way for that to really make sense is if, yet again, one of her parents stepped out of the marriage and had Priscilla as their child, but that, but Priscilla was never brought into the fold. She was never brought into the family. So she was like a secret agent, if you will, where, hey, you're my child, so you're going to but I want to hook you up in a position that you can never get fired from. It it, it almost it seems like Priscilla is Celine from the Haves and the Have Nots where you can't fire me. If you do, I'm going to reveal all your secrets and this and that. That's literally what's going on here. So, um, what is it? Victoria says, I'm going to get Secret Service to drag your ass out of here. And, you know, Priscilla just says, you messed with the wrong B. You slept with the wrong woman's husband and this and that so she just seems to flex her untouchability to victoria and she never admits to being the mole but not she has some sort of position that not even sam knows what her role is in all of this regarding the white house uh hunter comes in as priscilla is about to leave and asks what's going on and she pretty much acts like she didn't just go in there and scare the hell out of victoria because she mentions that she knows how afraid you are of your father. So after Priscilla leaves, you know, after saying, well, I'll be in the kitchen if you need anything, Mr. President. You know, I was just seeing if your wife was OK and need anything. But, you know, as Victoria is like literally freaking out, Hunter doesn't give a crap because he's getting ready for bed. It's like, look, Victoria, you after her husband, she has every right to be upset. So if you want her fired, you're the first lady. You go ahead and do it. Hunter, she knows my father. And <laughs> so. From there, Priscilla gleefully greets Richard in the hallway when he comes up there. It's like, uh, Priscilla, wh wh where were you at? In the bedroom? But what were you doing in there? I was just making sure everything's okay. Well, it is. It it's fine now. Oh, Priscilla, the way you talk to her, how do you have a job? Richard, I can't get fired. So, 
I'm not taking the night off. I'm not going home. Don't you have some silverware to polish? So she just walks away and he's just like, oh, what the hell's going on here? So from there, Victoria, um, well, we go over to Sam and Alonzo and Alonzo gets the call and he says that it's the first lady and Sam's like, damn, but um, yeah, uh, sir, she wants to see you and me. So they go up to see what Victoria wants. But we, you know, let me just talk about this scene. I'll get to the Lily and Bobby shit in a minute. So, um, Victoria is, you know, in the hallway and Alonzo and Sam run over to her to see what's wrong. And she pretty much leads them to the kitchen. And, you know, Priscilla and Richard looks like they're having a nice chat. You know, he's, uh, you know, at the sink and, you know, or whatever, you know, he's, he's doing his thing. She's doing her thing. They're chatting along the way. Victoria and Secret Service bust in there like the FBI, no pun intended. And she wants Priscilla dragged off the premises immediately. Priscilla's like, I'm not going anywhere. And Sam and Alonzo are asking, you know, Priscilla, you need to leave. They're basically requesting. She's like, why are you begging her? I'm the first lady. Get rid of her. So even Richard's like, Priscilla, you just, no, I'm not going anywhere. Richard, stay out of this. And then Alonzo and Sam are like, you know, they're just trying to figure out what to do. And then a phone goes off and... In the midst of this, Priscilla's like, don't you want to answer that? So Richard answers the phone, and then she's like, no, 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 get the first lady to do it. I'm not answering that phone, B. And then Richard's like, oh, ma'am, it's for you. It's your father. <laughs> and then as soon as Victoria takes the phone, all that vigor and anger and everything and all that sense of control just sunk away. And then Sam tries like, Sam, shut up. Okay, okay. And then we don't hear what is said on the other end of the line, but as soon as she hangs up the phone, Man, what do you want to do? Never mind, leave it alone. So she just rushes back to her room. Uh, Alonzo's like, okay, I'm going back to my office space. And then Richard and Sam, you know, Richard kind of walks out and Sam's like, Priscilla, what was that all about? You have a job to do. Okay. So he just, <laughs> he just leaves. So um, that was pretty crazy. And now we go back to Lily. She brings some, a sandwich and some food up to Bobby in the attic and, you know, just wonders if she had met Bobby instead of Donald, what would life be like? You know, a small house. We have a couple horses, maybe some kids living in Virginia somewhere. And I'm like, I live in Virginia. She's like, yeah, that would have been a life. And she figures that if you know what, I might as well trust you, Bobby, because you've had plenty of opportunities to, but if you wanted to hurt me, I think you would have done it by now. And he kind of reassures her, yeah, I'm not going to hurt you, Lily. And um, he, you know, reveals that he has Donald's car monitored. And it's like, oh, yeah, they're pulling the car around for Donald at the White House. So it must mean that they're waiting for him to get ready to go home. So, you know, he's like, you know what? Uh, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you alone. I want to be in the attic. So she goes back to her room. And um, we go over to Max and Blakely. They're at the same hotel that Bobby always stayed at, you know, in previous seasons whenever he met up with Lily. And Blakely's like, oh, so we're blindingly trusting Bobby now? And I'm thinking to myself, well, I mean, your main guy, Martin, seems to have potentially set you up or led you all astray or, you know, he got compromised leading to you being compromised. So at this point, you really have no choice. She's freaking out, wanting to keep going on the run. But Bobby, I mean, Max is like, look, we need to get some sleep. And the burner phone's there and a trash can at the truck stop. And um, she's like, wait, where'd you get that drink from? The uh, alcohol he had It's like, I got it at the uh, I got it at the gas station. I don't know if he said he swiped it or if he paid for it or whatever. But she's like, wait, how did, did anybody see you get it? Don't worry. So I think maybe he did pay for it. I don't know. But in regardless, uh, he just uh, he wants to unwind and get some sleep, and you know just reassures her. No, not sex. I we we just I just want to get some sleep. So um, they basically lay low. It was a short scene, and that could be said by for a lot of these scenes where if it wasn't related to Priscilla, these scenes were only as long as they needed to be, which I felt was a good thing. And that's why I gave this episode like a five, because if there were a lot of dragged out scenes of the characters I really don't care for that much, I would have had a problem with it. So Victoria gets in bed and she's pissed off at Hunter. Well, she's pissed off about the situation. She tries to, Hunter, this is bad. She knows my father and Hunter's like, eh, whatever. Because remember, Hunter's planning to off him anyway, so he doesn't care. But, um... Basically, Victoria found out that Priscilla is under Curtis's protection and 
It's the fact that Hunter's like, well, how about this? If you stop messing around for husband, maybe that means you'll be more loyal to us. You ever think of that, Victoria? So then she's like, wait a minute. You're up to something. Leave my father alone. Let the, mon let the man die in peace. Yeah, he's going to die in pieces. Dumbass, don't you know that if he's dead, there's no protection? So Hunter, and this is why I don't really like how Tyler has been writing Hunter because he's so inconsistent. One episode, he's genuinely concerned. And that's something that I really thought was a very good thing to add towards the end of season one. It's like, I mean, season two. Okay, he's finally understanding that he's obviously done nothing. And he's only made it this far because of Victoria's parents and those along the way to have protected and paved the way for him to stroll his white ass down. But now... His father-in-law is about to die and the protection's gone. And it looked like he got spooked by that. So I thought season three would be basically Victoria and Hunter, the unlikely of uh, partners, literally being them against the world, you know, and uh, trying to fight being taken down. But now we got Hunter just, again, not caring. He has the impression that once Curtis dies, it's not the protection that he cares about being gone. He just doesn't want to be underneath his father-in-law's thumb anymore. So he figures once he's dead, I'm going to run this place. Okay, let's see how that works out. Yeah, that, that really is going to work out. She says one more time, you better stop this plan or whatever you got going on because it's going to backfire. And I feel like this fool say, yeah, I love it when they backfire on me, basically in regards to women or the whores he screws around. So we go over to Priscilla, who's leaving for the uh, shift. And remember, the senior staff got called in due to the assassination attempt. So everybody's going to have to be back in the office in a few hours. But Priscilla's leaving. Alonzo says Sam wants to talk. So he can't give her clearance to go until, you know, they talk. And to be honest, uh, the way Alonzo didn't look her in the eye or anything, at first I thought Priscilla would say something about that. Like, you know, Alonzo, what's wrong? Because remember, during e early season two, you know, when she was trying to figure out what happened to Jean, Alonzo was her go-to guy because she wasn't speaking to Sam about the affair. And Alonzo was her, you know, I, I, I ain't gonna lie. I thought uh, Priscilla would give him some because the way, you know, we've been friends for so long. I felt like, you know, as a way to get back at Sam, but that didn't happen. But no, um, I thought that she would bring up, why are you acting so weird? Because obviously he probably spooked. He's like, I don't know what happened on that phone, but if it had the first lady scared, then I don't know. I don't think I knew you as well as I thought I did. So Sam comes up and takes to a back office and asks if she's the mole. And she just says, I don't know what you're talking about. Is that, is that what you want to call it? I've been working at the White House longer than you have, Sam. And I know people you don't. I have connections you don't. And he just says, fine, you know what? You can go home, but we'll t I'll, we're going to talk about this at home. Don't you dare come by. So then she just leaves and Sam is like, huh. So Donald tells Alan to go home because like I said before, everybody's got to be back in a few hours. Uh, he asked Donald to basically to sum it up. He asked Donald to keep him in the loop because of the situation involving Ellie and Hunter. Donald and Kyle is like, look, I don't care. I can't protect you or do my job to the best of my ability if you don't keep me in the loop. And Donald pretty much tells him, look, kid, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to flirt with me. And Hunt, uh, Donald's like, I mean, Alan's like, no. See, the promo had it going like, okay, Donald's going to be an ass, but... I think, and look, I feel like this could be interpreted in one of two ways. He talks about loving the thrill and whatnot. I mean, in season one where we, or yeah, season one where we had a couple of Allen scenes, you know, he just seemed to be the hardworking guy uh, working under Donald. And he kind of got, you know, he came into the office at the wrong time a couple of times, you know, him and he would see Kyle and Donald doing stuff. He would just see stuff and like, man, I ain't signed up for this. But maybe he was trying to pull in Ellie where I don't believe Alan's gay, but he was probably trying to say the things Donald wanted to hear in order to keep him in the loop for power because, I mean, that's what Ellie's doing, he, you know, flaunting her body and whatnot to make it ahead. But the thing about Ellie, and I'll get to this later when I get to that part of the episode, she's still in denial thinking that Hunter cares about her and will protect her. Hunter, the same guy that a few episodes ago was like, you know, we need to turn her over to your dad. You know, she's a threat to Jason. She's a threat to us. Guess that went flying out of the window. But in any case, um, 
that's pretty much it. You know, I know somebody online was like, why does it sound like Allen's clearing his throat every time he talks? I mean, I, he did it a couple times here, but it makes sense. I'm, you got to think about it from the position of sir and yes, sir, ma'am and yes, ma'am. Allen understands he is an underling. So when you speak to people in power, you want to make sure you come across clearly and uh, able to be understood. And as somebody who grew up in a house where if you raised your voice even if you weren't being loud you were trying to make yourself heard if somebody called you from across the house you would get ridiculed for it i have that issue where it's like i sometimes my voice isn't as loud as it normally is because you might not be able to hear me just because the thought of somebody saying who are you talking to you know rings in your head so i don't have a problem with that i just saw that online but no that's just alan being alan so we go over to barry smoking weed and Nancy comes in, and I like, this was like, God, when was the last time we seen these two just laughing? So, Barry smoking a joint, Nancy comes in because, you know, I think she woke up from the smell or whatever, and she's like, fine, if you want to finish it, just open the window, because you said you need to unwind, but don't do it for too long, because Miss Jody <laughs> probably smell it. <laughs> she's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, you know, she's nosy, and she's like, look, I just been, I can't believe that girl came up in here and took, off, took my child, and... Uh, he got the joint from Geo. Geo being the guy who was the um, the thug with the crew that was going to, you know, um, storm the Rakadushi compound. So this was just a nice moment. You know, we got enough Barry. We got enough Nancy. But even more importantly, they had a nice moment together. But like I said towards the beginning of the video, it's a damn shame Barry has to be high in order for this kind of scene to happen. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we got Alan confronting. Well, no, no. Alan goes to Ellie's office to ask, hey, come on home. But she like, no, I can't leave. And then, you know, he goes into the whole harassment thing about, oh, you don't want to leave him, huh? You know, oh, yeah, you don't want to leave your boy Hunter, the president, yada, yada, yada. But she's like, no, the there was an assassination attempt. I have work to do. So it looks like, you know, she's practicing going over some of her lines. And I, I'm not the biggest Ellie fan, but like I said before, it's nice to see at least one person trying to do their damn job at the White House. So that's all I got to say about that. So he leaves and Jason's waiting outside. And basically, it's just the same old, same old. He isn't mad that... Alan hit him. He seems more so confused. Wait, I was doing that to help you. You know, we're friends. It's like, no, I was never your friend. But then Alan made the grave mistake of pissing off. Uh, I'm just going to put it this way. You literally stopped Jason from assaulting slash murdering your roommate, essentially. I won't even say girlfriend, Ellie. And you decide, yeah, I'm going to piss off this dude who knows where I work at. He knows where my office is. He knows where I live. I I don't know. You just never want to piss off the quiet kid. So Jason just makes it clear. So let me get this straight. We were never friends. But what about when you were nice to me before? That was then. You're going to regret this. So when Jason leaves, Alan goes back into Ellie's office. And, you know, for once, I'm like, yeah, Ellie, listen to the dude. He's not being an ass. He's literally saying, yo, Jason's out there doing that creepy shit. You need to watch yourself down here. And Ellie's not concerned. And then I'm on Alan's side when he says, oh, wow, you're not worried because you think your son. I mean, excuse me, you think Hunter is going to protect you from his son, which is asinine because... I would ask, so what did you do to Jason? Because he almost, you know, you know, assaulted me and everything. Nothing's changed. Nothing's happened. So Ellie is still delusional. So she tries to keep her composure. But then as soon as Alan leaves, you could see by the expression on her face that she's getting a little nervous. So uh, we go over to Donald getting home. Lily, you know, putting on some, you know, I guess, lotion or moisturizer on her fine ass legs. And, um... Donald's like, so what was that? Were you in my office? You know, like that time Kyle caught you in there. I haven't been doing anything. I took a sleeping pill. I don't know about any assassination or anything or you being shot at. So I don't know why your laptop pinged. So that's essentially the entire scene. Like I said, didn't overstay its welcome. It was to the point. And that was it. So as soon as uh, Donald leaves, 
the room, you know, because it was like, I got a big day tomorrow. And then as soon as he leaves, she looks up at the attic like, Bob, you better be up there. <laughs> All right. So uh, Dale wakes up in the hospital. He's in pain. Looks like he had a nightmare. And this is something that I'm just getting incredibly sick of when it comes to Tyler Perry stuff. I've said it multiple times in regards to the haves and the have-nots where characters would seemingly survive something that they either should have been crippled by, sustained a massive injury, or been killed. But there's an asinine reason for why they survived. Apparently, Sharon said, uh, Sharon said, the doctor said, apparently the bullets that were used were like different bullets that didn't, weren't, you know, uh, fatal or whatever. The quail bullet. What was it like? The quail hunting bullet that Wyatt shot Jim with in, what was it? The cliffhanger of Have and Have Not Season 6. Basically, the incident that put Jim in the hospital for like a season and a half. It was stated it was a quail bullet. Thankfully, if it didn't hit any vital areas, but like maybe a couple inches to the left and it would have hit your heart. But it was the quail hunting bullet, so it wasn't as serious as a typical shotgun or anything bullet. So that made sense because Wyatt shot his father once. But Vince shot Dale, what was it, three to five times. And you're telling me he isn't dead. I know Donald said in what was it, the first or second episode of the season that, you know, I told him to you know, hurt your little boy toy, but not, you know, anything fatal. So basically, don't shoot him in any vital areas. Tyler Perry, please stop this. Stop this with the damn bullets. Because season one, I still can't get over the whole Richard and Barry sitting in the car and they're fighting over the gun. And then the gun goes off and the bullet goes through the door in a downward angle. But somehow, that bullet that shot through a car door apparently went through an open window which was at an upward angle from where the car was parked and where the gun went off and went through the window and shot a deacon who was asleep in his bed now you could argue well jeremy what if the bullet went through the car door and ricocheted off the sidewalk slash pavement and then make an upward angle and no that doesn't make any sense just please stop either have vince have shot him one time or have Dale killed, killed, or maybe had him stabbed. But Dale got shot multiple times. He had to have been laying on the floor for a good amount of time. Not hours, but I'd say at least an hour. Because apparently, what was it? The reason Sharon and Kareem went to the pharmacy was because Sharon law left her purse there or something. Which I still call bull crap on. Because remember, the last time Sharon was in the pharmacy was when her and Dale left to go to the White House to meet with Richard to talk about the Rakadushi. Then they went to the compound. Then they got ran off the road. Then they were in the hot... Well, Sharon was in the hospital. And, of course, you know, the next day, that's when she got discharged and her and Kareem left the hospital and it was still daytime. So, they... No. No, it doesn't make sense. No woman's going to leave their purse like that. So, just... Just come up with better ways of having people injured or to make it believable. That's all I got to say about that. But essentially, um, she's not sure why Sharon's nice. To, I mean, he's not sure why Sharon is nice to him in reference to Dale because he doesn't have anybody. He just, you know, he's still dealing with this traumatic experience. And I think that he said, hey, hit that button. I think it would like, you know, instantly put some meds in his body that makes him loopy, but it gets rid of the pain. And, um, from there, he kind of just fades in and out. So Kareem comes in and asks her to come home. You know, he takes her out of the room. But, you know, I don't think Kareem was being a complete asshole. Trust and believe, kind of like Barry. He's been much worse than he is in this scene. But he just says, hey, Sharon, come on. You need to go home. You need to get some rest. Uh, Well, he doesn't have anybody, Kareem. So, hey, not everything is your problem. Basically, because Sharon seems to be the nice kind of person who wants to help out everybody. But, you know, it has been a long day when you think about it. And for, I know I know it comes off as Kareem wanting Sharon to come home with him because he doesn't want to be alone. But he does make a point after everything that she's been through from the accident in the car to losing the kid and then being in the hospital herself. 
she would need to be at home for a good night's sleep. But it's like, no, I'll take a nap here and I will meet you at the pharmacy in the morning. And that's it. Thankfully, again, if this scene would have went prolonged, you know, like, come on, Sharon. But no, he was like, all right, fine. I'll see you tomorrow. And ironically enough, not long after um, she gets back to the room, Barry, smoking that joint still, calls Sharon. He's like, hey, I'm sorry. You know, basically apologizing for that outburst he made in the elevator and says, look, I missed you. And I want you to come home. Barry, you just want me because you always act this way. You always act nice and kind when you're horny. No, it ain't that. It's not that. Are you high, Barry? What? <laughs> I don't want you calling me when you're high. And she hangs up on him. That was funny. So we get to the last scene and Alan gets home and the guy just rolls in. I find it kind of strange that this guy that Victoria sent to kick his ass strangely looked like Jason. And, you know, Alan gets home. The guy just comes in behind him. I'm like, did Alan not lock the door or something? Or did this dude break in? Because this is Tyler Perry Lane. I'm going to assume he didn't lock the door because that's an ongoing theme with this show or these shows. So he comes in there with a stick. He's like, hey, what's your little ass doing in here? Look, the lady told me to come in here and beat you down until you got that chicken line. Man, your short ass ain't going to do. And with one kick to the chest, Alan is sent careening into the other room. And then that's how the episode ends. Yeah, this is all right. Like, this wasn't the worst episode of the season. This was easily the best one. But like I said before, if you don't mention the Priscilla stuff, this episode was kind of generic. But yeah, season three has... Yeah, it's a shame. After all the praise I gave season two, season three just ain't hitting it for me. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Like I said, five out of ten, I do I'd say the score is a bit too high, but because this episode didn't annoy me that much, I'm okay with the episode overall, but it could have been a lot better than what it was. Uh, yeah, I'll probably do a separate video about the Priscilla thing and um, how she's possibly connected to Curtis and Victoria. Things just don't really make a lot of sense, but yeah. Let's talk about it more in the comment section below. And thanks again for the likes and subscribes. Please continue to support the content. And if you want to donate to the channel, feel free to do so on PayPal or Cash App. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. And I'll catch you all in the next one.